Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Hold on, hold no, on. No, it's too late. I've already done it. I know, I know, I know. You are crazy. I know, because I, okay, let me tell you the problem that I have with that movie. Is Which, that I cannot take seriously anyone screaming either the words Hansel or Gretel <laughs> in an action context. I can't take it. Oh, uh, it is pretty funny to hear. Hansel! Hansel! Yeah. They have my sister. Gretel. Gretel? 
<laughs> that's not a word you say about name? somebody you want to go, you know, save. I can't. What, although it, it, I don't know if it's is it what's her what's her real name? Gemma? Gemma? Is it Gemma, Gemma or Gemma? Gemma, Gemma Arterton. Hmm. Isn't that it? Gemma Arterton. She'll al- she, she'll uh, always be Gretel to me. She was uh, what was it? Strawberry Fields. <laughs> is that her name in, in uh, uh, Quantum of Solace? Oh man, that's where she was. <gasps> I knew that I loved her a little bit from afar. <laughs> uh, so here's the thing about this movie. This is uh, this is Jeremy Renner. We we really shouldn't be talking about this because it's a January movie. But but the whole thing is it's Jeremy Renner. I think this was the movie that he said yes to. Uh, before he said yes to the Bourne movie, <laughs> and this is just sort of the one that came out a little bit later, and it's uh, that's that's my my hypothesis. It, probably in hindsight, after Bourne, you may not have chosen this movie. This this was one that I, as my understanding, it was on the shelf for a while. It had been finished, and they hadn't released it, and so they're finally releasing it. Right, writing on the uh, the tidal wave of. Uh, <laughs> All the new Jeremy Renner fans, and uh, yeah, that's the tidal wave. Although we should do well for him, we should say that the um, uh, you know Jeremy Renner's stock on the Hollywood Stock Exchange has taken a a nosedive of late, Mm. which is uh, unfortunate. So it won't hurt it too much. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I am. uh, Yeah, so I'm I'm excited about this movie. Uh, As excited I was the first time I saw it, Van Helsing. Did you get that? That was a little joke. Mm. And I liked Van Helsing about as much as I imagine I'm going to like. Uh, I Witch never Hunters. saw Van Helsing, so I can't. It was exactly the same that. kind of movie. It was exactly yeah. the same thing for him. Because he'd had the X-Men thing, and this was a movie that, you know, I probably shouldn't have said yes to. <laughs> Although, you know what I haven't seen? I can't believe I missed this. was Snow White and the Huntsman. Did you see that one? Yeah, I did. We I talked about it, didn't we? I, I did not see it, and so I don't think we actually uh, talked about it. Maybe we did. Well. You know who's so going to tell us? Have you seen it now? No. Oh, well, it's worth seeing. Although I, I still have a, quite a few problems with it, which we can talk about once you've seen it. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to start espousing my my philosophies on the problems of that film without uh, without you being fully in the know. Hmm. No, I want to be in the know. There you go. I want to be in the know. That's going to be my thing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be the guy who knows things. Um, <laughs> well, it's good that one of us will be that guy. <laughs> did you? Did you? Are you excited about any other trailers this this week? Well, uh, I, I honestly haven't watched a whole lot of trailers. I was excited to see the shorter version of the Cloud Atlas trailer, which was exciting. But other than that, I'm I'm behind, so I can't say I'm excited about any of them because I haven't seen any of them. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I haven't seen that many of them either. Um, I. Hmm. Oh, you I, know, what? I take it back. Ten years. That's Channing Tatum's new movie. It's like a ten year reunion. That trailer came out actually a few weeks ago, but I'm excited because some some buddies of mine worked on it. And so for that, I'm I, you know, I'll give it a shout out. All right. All right. No, I haven't even heard of that. So good on them. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about seeing that one. I am excited about TV season. Uh, because there are some shows coming out that I'm very excited about coming back, some new shows. Uh, I am, I'm really disappointed. I think this may be the worst lineup NBC has had in the last decade, uh, for their fall starts, really embarrassingly bad shows. Um, uh, but, uh, I, I, the reason I'm talking about TV is because this is yet another season of a lot of actors, uh, uh, film actors who we're seeing pop up on, on the small screen again. And so I'm interested in that. Uh, I'm interested in Homeland. We've got uh, Claire Danes and Mandy Patinkin and Damian Lewis on uh, in uh, uh, Homeland, which is, it looks weird. I watched the trailer of it. It looks weird. Claire Danes still looks like a kid to me. It's, I'm having a hard time believing she's a uh, uh, like depressed ex-CIA agent. Like like she's, you you expect her to still be an angsty teenager. Yeah, exactly. I can't, I mean, I, I love Claire Danes. I think she's delightful, and to me, she's still Juliet. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I don't have as much a problem with her as I do someone like Winona Ryder, who did always, seemed to carry that longer than many others. Yeah, no, you're right. That's a good point. 
But she's awesome. just petite, and maybe yeah. it's just because Winona Ryder always just seems so small, which yeah. sounds strange, but she just seems like she's a kid-sized person. Well, and she she's a pickpocket, and that's something <laughs> so, kids do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> so the other one that I that I uh, the other one that I think is of note for the first time in 37 years, uh, Dennis Quaid is headlining a television show. He is a really skinny, really skinny guy. Uh, he is a hardened 1960s sheriff in Las Vegas. The show is called Vegas, and this is of note to you. Are you up on this show? I, I'm not, but uh, I know you're excited minute. about wait, it. Back because... up a sec. Are you saying that Dennis Quaid highlighted a TV show 37 years ago? No, no, I'm no. He hasn't of? been on. He hasn't been. A, this is his first. The first time he's been on TV in 37 years. What that's was what he I've heard. 37 years I have, ago? I have no idea. I'm I'm just read, reading a quote, but th- that's not what I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I want to talk because I know you're going to be so excited about this show because the because uh, uh, your favorite uh, the the mobster in this show the his, the the big uh, uh, the villain is Michael Chiklis, most uh, well-known, very well-known for his role as um, The Thing in Fantastic Four. <laughs> that's, that's why I like him. <laughs> <laughs> or... <laughs> that was good, right? I was, I've been saving that like for four you, hours because I know how much you give love... yourself that pat on the back. I know how much <laughs> you love Michael Chiklis <laughs> for his role as The Thing <laughs> and, the, and the riffing. That that the thing did with Johnny Storm, I mean they really had a banter, wasn't that why you liked him so much? <laughs> oh yes, that was it. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, I love any time I see Michael Chiklis on uh, on television. The Shield. Uh, I got into the Shield because of you, and uh, so uh, one of the greatest series finales yeah. ever. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So that's very exciting. The other one that is of oh, note... Okay, hold on. Go ahead. Now that you All brought right. this up, Beretta. Yeah. That's what Dennis Quaid that was, was on. That's what Dennis Quaid was in, on. Uh, that's right. The seven, in 1977. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so the next one that I'm bringing up is uh, Revolution. Have you heard about this? I've seen the trailers for it. Okay, so... It, it, the commercials, I for, guess. For Hulu Plus users, you can get the entire premiere episode. It doesn't start until the 17th, but you can see the entire premiere episode this week. And I watched it. I watched this uh, revolution. And this episode, I believe this episode was directed by um, John Favreau, who is an executive, who is a producer of the show, along with J.J. Uh, Abrams. Wow, I hope it's as good as Cowboys and Aliens. <sighs> I oh. like that. I like that movie. Stop it. Oh, I, I did, did you I, I mean myself. did you take it seriously at all? I mean did you watch it and I mean I'm sorry, I, but Daniel uh Craig is one of the most uh satisfyingly physical actors on screen today. He is. I love watching that guy get the crap kicked out of him. I love it. Or kicking the crap out of others. Mostly just getting beaten up. He is exceptionally <laughs> good at getting beaten up. And in that movie in particular, he can, he gets kicked around. Uh, I want to I want to confirm, in fact, that he was uh, that John Favreau, uh, Revolu. I can't type and talk at the same time. Revolution. I want to confirm that that's what I'm that that was the um, season one episode one was in fact directed by uh, Favreau. Yes, John Favreau, writers Eric Kripke, and. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I did. I it feels an awful lot like Terra Nova. I have a hard time yeah, yeah. seeing anything that's, but Terra Nova. I saw the trailer or the commercial for it, and it, that's immediately my thought was it just felt the same as something that was just done recently and one that did not make it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, this is a this is a show. I think they were they're trying to uh, recapture. Um, the spirit of lost and i'm just not i'm just not sure they have it yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna watch it because i like any any show there there's you shoot a lot of arrows i'm into uh which brings me to arrow which hopefully is the spiritual sequel to uh <clears throat> my kids and my favorite right now we're almost through it smallville mm-hmm. which was you know lasted 10 years and this is uh the the green arrow story and uh, there are a lot of uh, good people behind this, and so I'm. And the dude does the most amazing pull-ups I've ever seen. If you have watched the <laughs> trailer, I've never seen anything like this. And word has it that he got the job because he was able to show off these uh, 
incredible pull-ups. So definitely check out the pull-ups. Um, okay, so RIP Michael Clark Duncan. Yes, very sad, very sad thing to have happened this past week. That was absolutely tragic. Um, and uh, very sorry to see him. I mean, that guy was just, uh, you know, he was such a satisfying character. And such yeah, a and such was, a terrific he wasn't spirit on to screen. Play a variety of types, right? You know, despite the size that he had, and and the obvious type of role he could get with that, he wasn't yeah. afraid to do things differently. And I think that's why something like the Green Mile came as such a nice surprise to see him really doing some great acting in that. Right, film. right. Yeah, I, it was. Uh, it was uh, I just you know he's not one you'd expect to we I ex- would expect to lose so soon. So he's yeah. a young guy. So um, let's see. Okay. So did you did you see any other movies this week besides the one we're talking about? Um. Well, I've I've been trying to just you know play my own catch up on on uh, some Zanuck films, and so I actually watched The Verdict for the first time. Oh yeah. Which I have to say was a fantastic movie. Man, see, I haven't seen it. Well, that's one that we'll have to we'll have to throw into like a, a you know maybe our David Mamet series one of these days since he wrote it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You liked it. I I was great. It was it's... fantastic. Or a Paul Newman series because I I just we, you you can't go wrong talking about how great Paul Newman is. Why did we and not? Got why are we not doing? Movies. Why is the verdict not a? Why do we decide not to put that in there? Well, because we're we're squeezing everything in before our Halloween oh. month. Yeah, we're trying to squeeze all of this in before Halloween, the month of October. The verdict got cut. That's too bad. Okay. It is, but I I'd like to say that we will make sure that we talk about it one of these days. Maybe November we'll say put that in. I know we can't. Next we're, we're pretty much booked <laughs> until February, I think. Uh, okay, so you saw the verdict. I I saw uh, I saw two films that I may, I feel. Uh, uh, weirdly dirty, even talking about them, but I'm I'm going to because they were one one of the two was a was a supremely satisfying uh, experience. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, this was so this was a, a night where I it was late and I was just you know that feeling where you're just kicking through Netflix uh, stream. I was on the streaming and I'm like, sure. you know what am I going to do? And I was I was on with Twitter with somebody and I was doing the Twitter thing and. And uh, I just sort of tweeted, what, what is the like guilty pleasure movie of the moment that I should watch? And, and, uh, and I got a series of responses. And the first one that I got was The Babysitters, because it was like an inverted risky business. Okay. All right. So I'd never heard of The Babysitters. Yeah, I haven't all. either. And so I... Um, and so I decided there it was on Netflix. So I I pressed the old play button, and and uh, it's uh, it's not quite risky business uh, actually. <laughs> it's not quite. So uh, it's uh, uh, it's John Leguizamo is in this film, and uh, I I very much like John Leguizamo. He actually produced it. It was written and directed by David Ross, who has done not much else. Uh, but uh, the the story is this: a teenager turns her babysitting service into a call girl service for married guys after fooling around with one of her customers. Wow! <laughs> yes, and that is the story. So uh, this girl, uh, this uh, high school junior, senior, whatever, she is babysitting for John Leguizamo's family, and he's having a terrible time in his marriage. And he takes her home one night, and as you can imagine, things turn to things, and they f- fool around like in an old train. And he uh, ends up paying her for the babysitting after they have fooled around. And that is the pivotal moment because that apparently turns her into a high school madam. And she, <laughs> that's the big moment of transformation. She confuses the fooling around in, with the money in exchange for the babysitting with the money, money. And it's a whole confusing money exchange. And now she's a prostitute. Wow. And then she, he tells one of his best friends about it, and the he, best friend says, "Well, I want a babysitter." And they all have babysitters now. And she has she's running a little, <laughs> a little thing. And you know what? The movie is it's pretty dark. It's pretty dark. I was really surprised at just how dark it was. Uh, it's um, it's more akin, I think, to um, I don't know, uh, the girl next door with less heart, more sort of mania. Um, 
and so it was you know it's it's uh it's it's definitely one of those late night movies but as a result of this movie there i am clicking around <laughs> and i i i i started watching this movie called good dick 2008 <laughs> film <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, this film's called Good Dick. It was 2008. <laughs> Why are you laughing at me? No, no. Why are you it's laughing great. at me? Go no, on. I'm serious. You should, you tell me more. Me, you should take me seriously. <laughs> you should take me more seriously in this thing. And so I watched this movie, and it was it's a short this, movie. This it's is as opposed minutes. to Dick. No, <laughs> no, this was the Good Dick. <laughs> You're not. Uh, you're not. I love being it. A good I, I can't. It's... You're not a good partner in this endeavor right now. I'm feeling extremely uncomfortable. No, I, I let me be your friend. Be <laughs> about good dick. <laughs> okay, this is a, a movie that was written and uh, directed by uh, Mariana Palka, and uh, Mariana Palka. Uh, is another uh, she has been in a number of other kind of indie type films um none likely none that you would have that you would have heard of but she's she is really very charming and uh, she actually stars in it as well with Jason Ritter and Jason Ritter uh has been in a bunch of other TV things uh m- most uh notably the event on TV last right. season, he was Sean Walker, and he actually produced this. Uh, uh, was one of the producers on this film, Good Dick. Uh, and it actually Joan of Arcadia and Joan of Arcadia. This this movie actually uh, went to um, it. It, uh, it was a 2008 Sundance uh, selection, but I don't I don't think it actually won anything. So you should see this movie because it's really bizarre this uh mariana polka plays this woman who uh who's a recluse and she <laughs> she meets um she meets jason ritter because she uh loves porn and he run he is an uh, employee at this kind of low rent uh video store and so he she goes in once a day and gets a bunch of porn movies and then goes home and watches them alone in her weirdly kind of dirty yet obsessed with cleanliness and disease apartment and it turns out she is i, I mean what you learn about her he falls in love with her and and it's a story of him trying to bring her out of her shell and kind of and and she's just horrible to him because she's just carries around a lot of damage and she plays this sort of damaged, strangely sexually repressed sexual extrovert, uh, it in a way that was that was really refreshing. Like it was, it's not, it's definitely not a porn movie. It's like it's about their relationship, and it's it's. I found myself really satisfied with this movie, so to speak. Um, <laughs> it's 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 kind of worth seeing. It's a it's a it's a charmer, and it's um, it's one of those that you stumble on late at night, and it's it's worth sticking around. The tagline for Good Dick, of course, is. What do you really want? <laughs> Why would they even? No, it it just doesn't fit with a poster that has the Sundance logo on it. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. The, uh, yeah, but it's not. It's not bad. It came out in two thousand eight. It's it's worth checking out. So all right, that's, that's what I got. Uh, neither of those movies are a good setup for the movie we're talking about today. <laughs> neither one of them. I'd love to see a, an interesting segue between them, but I don't know if we have t- the time to try to figure it out. Well, you know, uh, uh, Driving Miss Daisy is uh, the story of uh, the awkward, <laughs> a charmingly awkward Morgan Freeman trying to bring the sexually repressed geriatric uh, of Jessica Tandy out of her shell. <laughs> Oh my goodness! It's just like <laughs> driving Miss Daisy was the late nineteen eighties version oh. of Good Dick. Who knew that? Who knew that would be a re- uh, a, a reprisal? Uh, who knew? It's they a say spiritual there are, sequel. They say there are only really seven movies that have ever been made, and this is this is clear that Driving Miss Daisy and Good Dick are in the same category. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Oh. oh. So <laughs> you know what's awesome about this movie? To go I'm going to tell you where, to, where we need to go for this. Can can we? St- I know we usually do the numbers at the end. I, I do. Did you want to start with the numbers? We should start with the numbers because okay. this is one of those movies that was that that's like that, the reason I say we start with the numbers because this is the this is part of our Zanuck series, mm-hmm. right? And I think we need to back into this because this movie is a gem for a producer. 
by this point, I mean, last we spoke about Zanuck was Jaws, the beginning of a, a fantastic series of films that he was behind, um, many blockbusters and all sorts of amazing films that he he shepherded. You know, I mean, going from the, the 70s after Jaws, the Iger Sanction, MacArthur, Jaws 2, The Island wasn't so good, Neighbors wasn't so good, but then Verdict, The Cocoon, or The Verdict, Cocoon, uh, you know, the cocoon, the return, and then driving Miss Daisy. I mean, he he produced a great number of very popular, very um, popular with award people as well sorts of films. And driving Miss Daisy was a property that both he and his wife at the time, uh, Lily Finney Zanuck, um, who I believe actually was his the wife that he has been with all the way since um, since then. They found this property. They actually heard about it. They saw the play that uh, Alfred Urey wrote and really were interested. They wanted to get it, but nobody would give them money to make it. They were trying to make it. They had they wanted to, to get it made for $12.5 million. They got Bruce Beresford on to direct it. No the money to make it because they didn't think there was a market for a, a film about an old Jewish lady with her black driver in the 60s, you know, 50s, 60s, and their relationship. They just felt it was kind of a tedious, boring story, and nobody was was interested in giving the money. They had to slash the budget. And this is Richard Zanuck, son of Daryl Zanuck. They had to keep cutting the budget. They finally ended up at a budget of $7.5 million. They were pinching pennies all the way through, doing everything they could to scrape by, cutting whatever deals they could with locations and, and uh, you know, all the different people in, in Georgia that they were um, invading their homes and their lives when they were making this movie, cutting deals to get them to the premiere and all this sort of stuff just so they could get this movie made on the $7.5 million that they had. Bruce Beresford was was practically winging it. I mean, essentially, this movie was done as an independent film. They had so little money to do it with. And uh, and they did end up, you know, it did end up getting released through Warner Brothers, who distributed it and everything. But the Zanuck Company, Richard and Lily Finney, they were the ones who produced it independently with some money that they got, I believe, out of Canada to make the movie. And uh, and Bruce Beresford, I mean, he had to, he storyboarded the whole film so that he knew uh, all of his shots ahead of time because he knew he wasn't going to have time on set to plan anything. And so all of that stress going into the film at a $7.5 million budget, you're right, it turned into an, a major success at the box office because it made well over $100 million dollars. And it did really well for itself. In fact, in 1989, it's number eight of the films that came out behind Batman, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon 2, Look Who's Talking, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Back to the Future Part 2, and Ghostbusters 2. And then Driving Miss Daisy. Mm -hmm. It's the eighth highest grossing film of the year. It's, it's amazing how much money it made. Well, exactly. And that's, you know, this doesn't necessarily compare with, uh, well, doesn't quite literally does not compare with, with you know, Jaws last week, which I think we said, uh, you know, cost some, I think we said 12 million to make, ended up making nearly 500. Uh, but what Driving Miss Daisy did uh, was add to the cultural landscape uh, in in terms of retelling this point in history through a very intimate and subtle discussion of both age uh, and race uh, through and this, religion and and religion through this story of these two dear friends uh, as it formed over you know what was it fifty years or something? twenty five years twenty five like time. right seventy five years and so over that hundred years of the play. You know, we see a, we see this vast, vast <laughs> cultural change that we don't see in other films that that uh, cover such a vast uh, space of time. <laughs> <laughs> all, all thousand years. All thousand years. You know, it's not. This is this and two two thousand one <laughs> are the only two stories that really cover that. That span uh, that distance of time. <laughs> Oh yes, and space. Uh, so, uh, 
so the, what anyway the whole point is uh for that what that I was getting at was for Zanuck this ended up being a, a I I would say more of a contributor to his to to uh the Zanuck sort of legacy as a producer, uh, you know, he produced a lot of blockbusters, and this one, uh, this one in its intimacy, ended up, I, I think, having um, having uh, a significant impact. Well, it definitely did, and I mean, you know, he said it was one of the hardest films that he ever produced because they had so little money to do it, and it required everybody to really step up. And all of the people who were involved were doing it because they were so in love with the story. Mm -hmm. Which, when you're doing any low-budget project I've worked on, you know that, I mean, you really have to enjoy the project because, you know, the money isn't always there. Right. Right. So, uh, so this movie, clearly the money was not there, and yet there were uh, some... Uh, really fascinatingly discovered talent in this film in the form of Morgan Freeman and, and Jessica Tandy uh, in roles that are unlike roles that we'd seen them before. I mean, Morgan Freeman is, was coming off his stretches. I think, uh, uh, you know, he had some significant roles in the electric company. Uh, well, and he just easy, came easy off rider a and uh, on the name. I've got, I've got a look right now glory where he was, I want to say it was Street Smart. It was Street Smart where he was playing Fast Black. Yeah, it was it was a movie that came out um, a couple years beforehand, and uh, Christopher, Christopher Reeve was Reeve. a journalist who, uh, you know, this whole thing with him and the, you know Morgan Freeman's the pimp in the story. Anyway, wow. Morgan Freeman hadn't been in a lot of big roles, and he actually was in this off Broadway show that Alfred Dury had written called Driving Miss Daisy. He played Hoke, and uh, when when the Xanax approached, uh, approached Alfred Jury and they saw Morgan Freeman perform the show. They said, we have to have him. He was 52 years old. And he owned the role. I mean, he's amazing in the film. He's amazing in the film. I think, uh, you know, he, this, is, this was his, his standout role. I mean, this was, this was the movie that he, you know, that he became known for i think i would say i mean i know i don't think anybody really remembers him for from clean and sober i certainly didn't but i didn't see i him. think i remember him as the principal in lean on me which yeah. i can't remember i think that came out before driving with stacy it was the same year problem is lean on me and stand by me uh i get the i transpose those all the time you know yeah. one about the kids and one about the they're all they've all got kids they all have kids Once and then there was and then stand and, and deliver person. lean on me stand by me stand and deliver right that was the other one with the that's well, the other one, but that's a teacher, right? Not a principal, and right. also, but also based on a true story. Yeah, that's correct. But uh, but then you know, I mean, this was the role that got him the hit role in uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which I think we all remember fondly. Yes, and hard and hard rain. Yeah. So there were some, there were some, <laughs> there were some other movies in there. So uh, uh, so Morgan Freeman. So what do you? Uh, so you say he owned the role. Why did he own the role for you? You know, he just, this is a tricky character to play because it's very um, kind of like a stereotypical of the time sort of African-American with a lot of the yesums, uh, you know, it, the way that he speaks. It's it's just a very, it, it could come across, not playing it truthfully, it could come across as kind of a, a more of a, you know, like an Amos and Andy sort of character. And he really understood that role to a point where everything that he does is so truthful and honest that all the way through the film, you never see any of that. It's all just strictly this man. It's Hoke all the way through the film. And, and he's got this, this, this pride. He's got this, this um, just sense of himself and understanding, but also understanding of the place and time that he's at. And, and has to go along with all of the prejudices that that are a part of the world that he's living in, and and uh, he does that so elegantly and quietly, and it's it's uh, it's an amazing performance to see. What I like so much about it, to your point, is uh, you know when you talk about this film as a statement of race, uh, and and the way this film handles race, uh, I, I think is of note, and and I think. It, it strikes me this way because he deals with it, as you say, as a as from a position of of history and not necessarily emotion or politics. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, he he is very much, you know, my perspective is he's playing this as a character of the time. It, Morgan Freeman's own views on race, he's come out a, a number of times as, uh, you know, someone who's very frustrated with things like, uh, you know, Black History Month. He, he's, uh, you know, there was the legendary uh, Mike Wallace interview where he says, Mike, I'm going to stop calling you a, a white man if you'll stop calling me a black man. Um, you know, that, that this discussion of race can just be sort of over. Um, and, and, and so it's interesting to see, uh, you know, I, maybe with the gift of hindsight, watching this movie, knowing how Morgan Freeman is himself, uh, as the actor and professional, uh, deals with, and African-American deals with race, um, to see him play this film uh, or play in this film as sort of straight up historical figure that, that, you know, this relationship uh, between Miss Daisy and Hoke um, is uh, almost takes place under a bell jar. Yeah. And, it, and it's such a beautiful relationship that develops. And the only time we see that pricked, you know, there are a couple of, of moments in the film where we see that the, that bell jar, or they leave the bell jar. But but uh, it, you know when when he leaves, when they leave uh, and and go to to the uh, birthday party, uh, they go to mobile, over, right? Cross over into they cross over to Alabama, Alabama, and uh, and they get pulled over by the police. And there's that first uh, that first sense that you know they're looked at sideways. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, it ends up being uh, all that much more sort of impactful. Um, as a result of of their experience, I mean, we get to see them. You know, it's almost like we know that there's something that should be wrong, but the way they play this character is, she's an old crazy lady, and he's a guy who's going to bring her out of his sh- uh, out of her shell, and they achieve that. And and uh, in doing so, they become sort of the team that we get very excited to watch in the first act. And I think that's um, I think that was it's brilliantly uh, architected. Yeah, and then I think that is paid off uh, subsequently when we have the scene later in the film uh, with Martin Luther King where she goes to a speech and uh, in a very roundabout and delayed way kind of asks him if, if he would go even though she's not really coming out and saying that. And he knows that she got the invitation. He's seen the mail and, and she never spoke to him about it until they're pulling up in front of it and he's you know clearly not really being invited by her and and, and so you can still see that there's this still at that point there's still this misunderstanding as far as what all of it really means and she doesn't really still doesn't really quite see it and it's it's amazing how Martin Luther King's words in that speech really i, I think you know sink in for her a little bit, although she doesn't really, her character, the way she is, never really knows how to act on it. But as the audience, you know, we hear that and we, we can see how it's affecting people. And here, let me read this, this last bit of this uh, speech from Martin Luther King that he has in the film. History will record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and indifference of the good people. Our generation will have to repent not only for the words and actions of the children of darkness, but also for the fears and apathy of the children of light. I mean, it says a lot, and and I think that that she hears that and uh, is a something is awakened in her, even though her place in the world in the '60s, she doesn't really know what to do with that. She what she captures is so very much. Uh, you know, my great grandmother, you know what I mean? Like what she, mm. it, it, that she exists as a person who was sort of stuck in her time. That for her, it wasn't an issue of race. It was just an issue of, of this is of the way things were. It's, it's not as if there was, um, th- there wasn't anything wrong with, you know, having, um, with with a, a family having servants, um, because that's all she ever knew, and okay. what we see in Miss Daisy is somebody who um, is filling a role, and as she gets older, she doesn't know how to handle filling that role, 
uh, as, as the world changes around her. And what is so beautifully kind of ironic uh, as this movie is, uh, plays out is that it would be this uh, aging black man that would help her understand how to be an aging Jewish woman better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's that's uh, to me that relationship makes makes I mean that's what that's what makes the movie so special is that it's that it's that ironic social context that that they capture so perfectly. Well and and even with all of the social issues that are kind of the undercurrents of the story it really boils down to two people from different worlds who despite all of their differences are finally able to get past those differences and realize that they're just people. And as she says near the end, you're my best friend. Right. You know, I mean, that's to me, that's, that's what really stands out in this film is it's, it's so much more than, than just about the race issue. And obviously it's all still there and it's all still very prevalent, but it's about getting past that and, and finding just who is under the skin. Well, right. I mean, that's the that was Morgan Freeman's. Uh, God, that was the wizardry of the portrayal. Is that for Morgan Freeman, there was never a race thing. Mm-hmm. You know, for for Hoke, there was never a race thing. There was an awareness that he had a role and he was paid to drive that car. Yeah. And and he knew out of the goodness of and kindness of his spirit that he was going to be helping her. And and if that meant dusting the light bulbs. Uh, that meant dusting the light bulbs. If that meant uh, cutting up and feeding her pie, then that's what it meant. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's beautiful. Dan Aykroyd, who is, I think, uh, we would probably agree, a real doodle in this movie. <laughs> he is the doodle. Dan's that's the one of doodle. the funniest lines that strikes me every time I see this. I know, right? It's just like, I really want to remember that and latch onto it so I can say it to people, but, but I you never, never do. do. No, I you never, never do. remember it. <laughs> it's just so funny. You're a doodle mama. You're a doodle mama. You know, it's oh, interesting. Damn. Nobody wanted to play that role because it's not a very big role. It's not a role that has a lot of meat to it. And they were really struggling trying to find someone who was interested. And finally, an agent called them and, and uh, said, okay, this is going to sound out of left field, but what do you guys think of Dan Aykroyd? And uh, they all ended up loving the idea, and he was really interested in playing the part. And he does it so – there's so much – I mean, there, you're right. There's not a lot on the page for him, but what is there and what he does with it is so subtle and so simple – and it just, it, everything he does just plays so perfectly for the character and his understanding of, of, of this world between, uh, you know, between Daisy and, and Hoke and everything. And it's just, I mean, it's clearly um, a great performance, and I think he was deserving of getting an Oscar nomination for it. Well, I, I do too. And it's interesting to look at where that movie, I mean, speaking of left field, I mean, this was coming off of, you know, nearly well there's pretty much two two decades of you know typical dan Aykroyd fare uh you know from 1941 the blues brothers to, you know immediately before um my stepmother is an alien she's having a baby the great outdoors uh you know caddyshack 2 um th- these were you know, great comedy movies, and and really, I, I think there's sort of a shocking context shift when you see, uh, you know, Dan Aykroyd on screen, and yet he, I think he did a fantastic job. It, yeah. It's funny to, to watch him. It makes me wonder how. Do you know anything about uh, uh, how Bruce Beresford uh, shoots? I mean, I'm I, because what this movie feels like to me is it feels like it was shot in sequence. Almost like I, it was shot in camera, like it was edited in camera. Uh, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I mean, obviously, with a really tight production schedule, um, they were they were probably having to base it all around uh, actors' availability. I know Jessica Tandy was actually um, 
sick through some of the filming and she wasn't able to work full days. So, I mean, I, I think that yeah. they just had to kind of wing it and shoot whatever they could whenever they could. Well, there are two things that, that make me think that. It, and uh, the first is it just feels like you can see Dan Aykroyd mature in this character uh, almost as he matures uh, as a character on screen. Um, and, uh, and sort of the second point to that is they, all of these characters do such remarkable maturing, uh, you know, in, uh, through the course of, of the 25, anywhere between 25 to 75 years, depending on how you, how you look at the movie <laughs> how you and view the how you view the time, <laughs> how you, your understanding it's... of time. Uh, and I wonder what sort of effect that is, but, but Dan Aykroyd's, you know, taking on that serious role from his opening, you're a doodle mama to seems a shame that we're selling this house, uh, you know, while mama's still alive. That ends up being an incredibly powerful line uh, yeah. to me as they, as the two of those men walk through the house together, even just for a few seconds, that ends up being a really pivotal sort of a uh, punctuation on the end of the movie. It's it is, and and even the final scene when he be his mom with uh, Hoke and she's in the nursing home, and and he understands, you know, from her, you know, saying Hoke's here to see me, not or talk to me, not you. And he he's like, well, I can see that she's she's you know, having one of her good you. days. Yeah. she wants you all to your, all to herself. And he's he's so okay with that. It's not like you know, well, she's my mom, you know, and and all of that sort of thing. And it's I don't know. It's just he he's everything that he's doing is simply and just honestly. And it's it's a, it's I wish Dan Aykroyd did more stuff like this. Chaplin and sneakers and yeah, um, I mean, he's had his not so in your face comedy sorts of films. Right. I mean he's he's definitely had some that are a little less comedic, more dramatic. And uh I mean even some of the films that he did with John Hughes yeah. have a little more of that Heart. Uh, that vibe rather than the straight out over the top uh my stepmother is an alien sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's great to see and you know it's uh I, I don't need, I haven't seen him. I guess he was in the campaign which just came out, which I hadn't seen. So campaign, but Yogi Bear. The other major person that we didn't talk about is just the amazing Jessica Tandy, who's so great in this role of Daisy. And she hadn't done a lot of films. She was a, a big theater actress, and I mean, obviously, she was in Cocoon, which is where the Xanax came across her a few years before. But she was never a, a huge actress in film and uh it's it's so great seeing her when she does these films because man is she just an amazing presence boy that is the truth uh, it, i did not uh i didn't know that she, that both the cocoon movies had come out before driving miss daisy yeah i well i i don't remember cocoon the return <laughs> although i think i actually saw that one before i saw cocoon and then afterwards, uh, you know, she didn't she didn't do a whole lot more. Um, fried green tomatoes, obviously. She, um... yeah, and nobody's fool, which yeah. was uh, her final film, um, which was uh, another great Paul Newman movie. Yeah, man, she she did some incredible work. I think of <clears throat> of all that you know, we we just sort of talked a little bit about the the age makeup. Do you have any background on? how they ended up doing the aging because Jessica Tandy of all of them ends up, it, it, she, it, it almost looks like she, uh, you know, lost 30 pounds over the course of the movie. Yeah. Uh, she was, when, she was stunning. When they shot this, she was, uh, nearly 81 years old and they had to start by making her look younger. And they, cause when we start the film, Daisy is, uh, I think, about 70 years old. And uh, so they had to kind of clean up some wrinkles and just make her look, give her, you know, nicer wigs and all that. And then by the end of the film, she's about 95 years old or, you know, uh, 120, if you, uh, depending on how old, you, how long you think the film went. But yeah, um, she's about <laughs> 95. And so then they actually had to age her up a little bit. And so. The, I mean, and makeup people on this film did an amazing job of of transitioning, not just her, but every one of these people uh, all the way through. And it's just it's stunning to watch her transform from the the spirited Daisy at the beginning of the film to the Daisy that we see at the end in the nursing home. 
struggling with dementia. That scene where she is calling for Hoke as he comes in the door and is is looking for her school papers is is um, another one of those that, that in the structure of this of the film of the script in particular these it is for a, a drama uh, it is made up of notably short sequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is one of them that is is really so short. And we see in, um, you know, probably less than a minute and a half, we see her um, struggling to find her papers. Hoke is, is, you know, comes to this realization and makes a call to to um, Bully uh, and says, it's just different. It's just different this time. And then, uh, you know, we we sort of get to experience her having fallen apart. Uh, and what's interesting about that film or that scene in the film is Bruce and Alfred really came up with the idea that the over the course of Hoke following her through the house as he's trying to talk her down from this state of dementia that she's in, by the time we get to the end of that and she sits down, they're in a room of the house that we've never been in before. It's a completely new room, uh, kind of symbolizing, you know, they're in a new place in their relationship because this is the first time that she is able to, you know, break through some of those barriers and take his hand and say, Hoke, you're my best friend. Right. Right. Uh, you're my best friend and, uh, you know, I need to see, I'm, he's here to see me. I mean, those moments of awareness end up being so much more powerful. Yeah. What about, what about this uh, Bruce Beresford uh, character? He's I... an Australian. He's uh, done some some interesting films uh, that uh, some of which I I like and some of which um, I've just never seen. But he it's it's interesting. He's a director who's really taken a lot of films that are uh, you you could almost call them like you know dramas or, or or women's films or things like that like crimes of the heart um tender mercies is an, is an amazing film breaker morant um and and then black robe is a great film that he did and then he's done some films that i don't like at all like her alibi silent fall double, Je- double jeopardy but he really i think knows how to just take amazing stories and tell them in a way that is incredibly moving and honest to the characters that it's funny i uh, this is he's one of those directors that I have seen very very few of his films mm-hmm. you know sadly I think uh, uh, Tender Mercies you're right was absolutely terrific uh, Robert Duvall uh, Crimes of the Heart I think was uh, was another great film and then Her Alibi with Tom Selleck like yeah. it just uh, you know th- I think those are the only three other movies that I've seen besides Driving Miss Daisy of his you know uh, significant filmography and and so I'm not sure how to characterize Bruce Beresford as a director I mean he tells he tells uh, you know these sensitive stories very sweetly it's, it seems like a um, uh, I mean uh, that's there are directors who do that what what do we what do, what do we get from his style I mean what do you make of the Bruce Beresford style is there a way to kind of pin him down uh, you know if you were to see if you had never seen Paradise Road uh, would you be would you see that and say God this is a Bruce Beresford film you know I don't think I've seen I mean you're right he's got uh, according to IMDb he has 51 titles including some that are um, in pre production that he, that he has listed as director credits having only seen like five or six i don't know if i can fairly judge but um i mean i don't think he has a very outgoing um in your face sort of production style i mean driving miss daisy is is simple in all of its um execution as far as how he puts things together it's only on a rare occasion do you have a really interesting setup like the one in the mirror with with bully and his mom daisy um, when we see their reflections and, and the whole scene is shot in mirrors. Um, it, that doesn't happen very often. It's mostly pretty straightforward. And he really just kind of lets the characters drive the story. And, I, you know, it's when you have a director like that, he, he knows so well how to get what he wants out of the actors. And he lets the, the shots all kind of work around the actors that it's hard to it's hard to pin a very specific style of filmmaking on him because it's, it's really just more about the performances that are coming across on the screen. And as long as they're very honest, I, I think that that 
speaks volumes to the quality of a director making a a solid film. But I, I, I it'd be hard to say, oh, after watching, you know, Paradise Road or or Mao's Last Dancer or something, and going, oh, that's a Bruce Beresford film. Yeah, that's my uh, that that's my trouble with it. Like I'm I'm, I'm not there. It's an it's an intimate um, uh, film. It tells a um, a long story in a very small space, uh, and it does it with a lot of heart. And that's that's about where I, I you know I enjoy the movie. I, well, it's interesting because you know this film was nominated for quite a few Oscars when it came out. I believe it was nominated for nine Oscars, and it won three or four of them. I think it was four Oscars, Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Actress, and Best Makeup. Um, The director, Bruce Beresford, was not nominated. It was um, in his place, uh, well, it was kind of a funky year. And actually a lot of people, this this is a big year of contention for the Oscars. A lot of people really complain about this year. Driving Miss Daisy, Born on the Fourth of July, Dead Poets Society, Field of Dreams, My Left Foot were the five pictures nominated for Best Picture. Um, the Best Director, they nominated um, Oliver Stone for Born on the Fourth of July, Woody Allen for Crimes and Misdemeanors, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, could very well have been and maybe should have been nominated for Best Picture because it's one of his best films. One I of think. his best films, right. Kenneth Branagh was nominated for Henry V. Jim Sheridan was nominated for My Left Foot and Peter Weir was nominated for Dead Poets Society. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of funky. And, and I mean, just some of the other films that they left out of the of the race that very likely could have been in there. Crimes and Misdemeanors, I already said. Glory, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Enemies, Love Story. And the big one that is the, re- is the reason I think that a lot of people complain about this year at the Oscars was Do the Right Thing, which is another story about race. Right. It's a story about race that is uh, of a notably different tone than Driving Miss Daisy. A very different tone. Very different tone. I mean, Driving it's a, it's Miss a fantastic Daisy is, film. It, you know, in the probably Spike Lee's best film. I, I, I totally uh, agree. Uh, Spike Lee. Spike Lee's a filmmaker who has a lot of misses and very few hits in my mind. I mean, I like that he's always trying to do something different, but I just don't think he does it very well. Do the right thing. I think is arguably his best film. Um, my big gripe with Spike Lee is how hateful he is about things. In fact, he still, I found an interview with him from last year. This was just last year talking to the Hollywood reporter, um, about, oh no, sorry, tar- talking to Charlie Rose about do the right thing and driving Miss Daisy. And this is a quote in 1989, do the right thing was not even nominated what film won Best Picture in 1989? Driving Miss Mother Effing Daisy. That's why the Oscars don't matter, because 20 years later, who's watching Driving Miss Daisy? There are many times in history where the best work does not get awarded. So, <laughs> it's like, seriously, Spike? Yeah. You're that bitter? Oh. Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's frustrating that he is so negative and angry about this and is I, I think in many ways unable to see past the the great stuff that he was saying about race and do the right thing and he's not able to see what driving miss daisy was saying about race and i remember even hearing something about it. he's like oh you know he's playing that whole amos and andy angle with mm-hmm. driving miss daisy and i'm like you're not seeing the film man you're not seeing it well i don't know and i you know i it's it's hard to armchair race discussion from my position. I mean, I don't, I, I that's not, I, I don't fashion myself a, a filmmaker who makes uh, movies that center on a discussion of race. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Spike Lee has made a lot of, you know, a, a lot of films that deal directly with race. And, you know, um, from, from his position as a black man making a, making black movies, you know, for a, um, for, for a sort of activist, uh, gosh, I don't even know if this is, if this is necessarily fair. I'm saying for an activist sort of black audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
I am sort of the next target audience outside of that, you know, like I'm, I don't think I'm in the core audience of Spike Lee's uh, early films. Uh, whereas Bruce Beresford is making, you know, Driving Miss Daisy. Um, it, it's a movie about race for white people. Yeah. I, gosh, you know, I mean, again, it's <laughs> so like, Oh, I, I can totally see why yeah. he'd be pissed. Like I, I get why he would feel that way because it, particularly because of the passion that he has, uh, you know, to his work. I think the problem with him, with the sort of indignance that comes out of that is that it, it almost does a disservice to uh, the, the three decades of awesome work that Spike Lee has done since. And um, you know, he's, I, I think he's a, he's a great filmmaker and he's done some stuff that's, uh, that is really, powerful and it and you know he's getting more and more sophisticated and i think you know do the right thing was a great movie and he's gotten better uh in in you know in the sort of sophistication of the movies that he's brought so let it let's let's move on you know <laughs> um, i'm glad you think he's gotten better <laughs> i do there's some movies like man inside man was a terrific well, film God, inside man please. was a great film i but 2006 and, and it's interesting because that's a film that I think he did really well. And I was completely floored that Spike Lee directed it because it's so yeah. not the sort of film that he typically is trying to make. Yep. 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 So, uh, but you know, he, he does, he does some good stuff and, you know, to be fair to Spike Lee, it's not just him. There are plenty of people out there that feel driving yeah. Miss Daisy uh, was uh, hurtful to black America. Yeah. You know, I found another, uh, another website, um, the Grio, where he says he or she, I don't know who it is. It's a blog says this ultimate white liberal fantasy about an old Jewish woman befriending her kindly back black driver during segregation may have had good intentions, but its simplistic narrative pales in comparison to the more intense exploration of race of the same year. Do the right thing. And again, they bring up do the right thing. But, um, um, it, but there's a lot of people who, who see that they, that this is a simplistic narrative, and that one is really exploring the race issue. Yes, it is exploring the race issue, but they're two separate films. They're not doing the same thing. And, you know, to be so, you know, blind by only looking at Do the Right Thing as what it's exploring and not seeing the story that Driving Miss Daisy is, is trying to say, I think is just not keeping your eyes open to what the story is. Let me, so let's take a step back to, you know, 19, 1990, celebrating the movies of 1989. And you're, you are, uh, your vote is going to be the swing vote. Let's say <laughs> all the other films have gotten equal votes and, uh, and it's your vote. Would Driving Miss Daisy have, have hit the, gotten the Oscar? From you? Uh, well, are you asking me as who I was in 1990, or are you asking me now to jump back in time to 1990? Are though would those seriously be different answers? They would be. I hadn't even seen uh, "Do the Right Thing" in 1990, so I, I don't think I was in a place to really to get what he was trying to do with "Do the Right Thing" back then. Like I was, I was thrilled with the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture, and I would have loved to have seen like Batman get nominated. Like I was in a very different <laughs> mindset back then. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I, I mean, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. I f I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you. <laughs> now, let's just take the ones that were that were uh, nominated: Driving Miss Daisy, Born on the Fourth of July, Dead Poet Society, Field of Dreams, and My Left Foot. Now, Field of Dreams we've already done on this show. We know we both like this movie. Stunningly good movies in that list. Would Driving Miss Daisy have been the Oscar for Best Picture for you? I think I would have picked either Dead Poet Society or Field of Dreams as my pick. It really. I mean, well, I, and it probably would have gone to Field of Dreams because, you know, that surprises that story, me. That really it, it just me. hit me it, like I was in the perfect place for that film to to hit me when I watched it. Yeah, and I think. And it, well, and Dead Poets Society, too. I mean, the whole Oh, Captain, My Captain thing at the end. I mean, that was just that was great stuff. I mean, those films really um, were amazing stories and I really love them. And I think I got more out of those sorts of films than. Um, than Driving Miss Daisy or My Left Foot or Born on the Fourth of July back in 1990. That's, it, you know, it's interesting because I, I'm with you. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm as a, at the time, um, God, 89, 
How old are we in eight? Were we in 89? <laughs> so 18, 17, 18? Yeah. As a, you know, as a, a privileged white kid going to college uh, and having so little perspective on the world at that time you know for the movies that were that were there i mean driving miss daisy i had no i had seen it um but i didn't you know i didn't really understand it born on the fourth of july i loved but again i didn't really understand it i loved it as uh, you know for what it was right you know on its surface i didn't understand it dead poet society i understood because i went to a school like that and i under you know apart from the suits i understood that environment and i uh, I, I, as much as I hated it, I loved it. Uh, I, you know, just, I loved it even more. Um, and, and, you know, field of dreams, uh, again, you know, I'm, uh, I, I think I had to age to, to get field of dreams in my left foot, but dead poet society hit me, you know, where it, yeah. where it hurt. Um, yeah. Cause it's high school kids. I mean, we were high school yeah, kids yeah. when, during this time. So, right. Right. So, um, so I, you know, driving Miss Daisy would not have been on the radar. Now, who now knowing who you are now, what, does it hold up? I think it's an amazing, quiet film. I really love Driving Miss Daisy, and I've I, I've always felt that it it has this quiet presence that I've really been able to enjoy. Would I pick put it on the best picture list? I, I. Honestly, I, I, if I were taking anything off first, it would probably be my left foot because, I mean, I saw it in 1989 and I've never seen it since. I remember loving it, but I just haven't seen it. So I've never had the draw to go back to it. So that would probably be like the first one off for me. And I would put Do the Right Thing in there as my fifth nomination. My next one off probably would be Driving Miss Daisy and I probably would put something like Crimes and Misdemeanors on there. Um, so it's interesting how, as as you know, you grow and change, yeah. your perspective of these different films um, well, and changes to, as to, well. To Spike Lee's point, uh, you, you know, in some respect, he's wrong. People are still watching Driving Miss Daisy, but you know, based on whatever, I don't, I don't know what, uh, based on a, uh, you know, Hollywood politics, uh, uh, based on a misunderstanding of a discussion of race, that movie won Best Picture, and I, I don't think that that particular award necessarily holds up, in spite of it being an absolutely terrific film. Film that tells mm -hmm. a very sweet story and you know other awards to me that don't hold up i love jessica tandy's role i would not have given her uh if it, you know had well she she probably deserved i as i look at the other ones that were in there you know isabella jenny and as camille claudel and jessica I, yeah. the music box the only I mean, other one i saw i i still have seen on that list is michelle pfeiffer and the fabulous baker boys and i'd, I'd yeah. still go with jessica tandy over michelle pfeiffer for yeah that. i probably would but but the one that i think it is uh uh a, a real shame of the best actors that were uh, nominated: Daniel Day Lewis, Kenneth Branagh, Tom Cruise, Morgan Freeman, and Robin Williams. I think Morgan Freeman should have should have walked away with the Oscar for for best actor. I think his his performance was fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, Daniel Day Lewis is pretty good though. Yeah, I know, but Daniel Day Lewis is yeah, oh, man. it's always good. He's, he's like always, Meryl Streep. He, he should is. just get an award he's every just year. Gets the, just <laughs> yeah, he acts. Come on, you know it's like. Uh, I don't know. There are those that are just like every time you pull the arm on the slot, you know you're gonna you're gonna win All right, something. All right. So he shouldn't be allowed to be nominated anymore. He's just that good. <laughs> there should Merrill be a list. Get their the, own little the, private award chamber, and they're gonna call it the Perma Oscar. And it's yeah. just you know, uh, oh look, Daniel and Merrill are in the box seats again. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, true I, enough. True I, enough. I, so, as far as best original screenplay, I definitely would have picked uh, Do the Right Thing over Dead Poets Society for the, for the script to win. Um, more so, well, I mean, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, boy, I don't know. That's, that's a tricky one. Crimes and Misdemeanors, there's that's no a way great, sex, I'm, that's a really great year. You got those three. I can't believe Sex, Lies, and Videotape was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, although I think it was probably the best of them uh, because it was certainly the most original, and, the, and I think it's it's likely Soderbergh's best script. Yeah. Uh, but that Dead Poets Society won. I'm not losing any, you know, I'm not crying over no, that. I, it was I'm a not terrific either. film. I'm not either. But I, I, I do think Spike Lee, like, I personally, I don't think he's done a better film since Do the Right Thing, except maybe Inside Man. But that's just such a totally, completely different film, yeah. type yep. of film. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, I don't think he's done anything better than Do the Right Thing. And that would have been the one I would have given him an Oscar for. 
Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I think the problem I think the problem is and I you know the is is that problem of context and to Spike Lee these were two movies that were dealing with race and one of them was dealing with race in a really um, you know soft soft peddling the story of race and he was making the story that was confrontational and 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 really you know forward uh, sort of more progressive story. Yeah, and, and he still wants to be confrontational yeah, about that even. Yes, exactly. And and the the I, I think that you know, in, in hindsight and from my perspective as the as the white kid, um, they're two very different movies. Yeah. They're two very different, different di- very different messages. So, all right. It's, I think it's worth it for everybody to watch both of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> everybody should watch both of these Love movies. Love for all. At the same time. <laughs> right next to one another. You That'd be great. Fight the power. power. Fight the power. <laughs> As we got them driving along, got Hot Zimmer's music playing over <laughs> Rosie Perez dancing. I uh, okay, so the that'd music... be an interesting mashup. I want to see somebody do a YouTube mashup of those two films. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Man. Okay, but on the music, just before we, you know, do start, before we start getting to the part where we start to wind down, uh, the music <laughs> is so annoying. What's annoying? I'm the, sorry, you cut the, out. The music is annoying to me. You think the music's annoying? Hans I think Zimmer's it's music? Horrible. Really? Horrible. And I'll tell you yeah. why. First of all, because that damn theme. That there is like no variation on that theme. Da, 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 da. It's like a music <laughs> box that I want to just ja- I want to hurt myself badly when I hear it again. <laughs> and I, I think the problem is because there is zero life in it. It is one hundred percent synthesized, and you can absolutely tell it does not hold up over the last uh, uh, over the last couple of decades. It holds up as a. It, it sounds like my Casio you know, 46 key keyboard, uh, or my, my Yamaha DX seven. That's what it is. It's my Yamaha DX seven keyboard. Uh, I could have reproduced the entire score to driving Miss Daisy, uh, on that keyboard. And it would sound exactly the same. It's just lifeless. I I love this. I love the theme. Lifeless and dead. (laughs) Lifeless and dead. Ah, what can I say? I, you know, I'm a sucker for some, uh, some Hans Zimmer, you know, he's, he's got some stuff that he's, I just love. So. Th- to be, uh, to be sure he's done some good stuff. This was a, there was an era in the, in the eighties when there was a lot of this synthesized stuff. And I, I don't know if it was, they were just trying to crank out too many, uh, but see, I, I felt this was like the, one of the highlights of what you could do with the synthesized stuff. Oh no, I think we're here. I think we're at that point now. No, I mean uh, of the time. Sorry, mm. of the eighties, uh, like of the of the synthesized music coming out of the eighties. You know, you've got something like this, or you've got something like what was that awful Tom Selleck movie with all the little robot spider things crawling around? Uh, uh, uh Minority Report. No, Tom Selleck. Oh, Tom Selleck. <laughs> You know the spider thing that got his eye. <laughs> the Minority Report yeah. prequel. <laughs> yeah. No. God. I'm sorry. I just I was on Hans Zimmer's day. Cause, and and I want to say because we can get back to the, the the where he was the policeman and he was trying to track down all the rogue robots. Yeah, the little rogue spider robots. That yeah, were, yeah, yeah. God, it was a terrible movie. But that had an absolutely horrible synthesized score. And this one, I think, had a great synthesized score. And that's just me. I know you hate it. Well, no, I'm just saying I think you're I think you're right. That one was also horrible. <laughs> so run away. See? Run away. Silver lining, we agree. <laughs> and then he turned out this piece of got well, I don't he did he didn't do the one, the Tom Selleck one, did he? Please tell me he that, that was No, no, no. Zimmer. I think it was uh I want to say it was Jerry Goldsmith actually. Jerry Goldsmith, as great a composer as he is, went through a spell in the 80s where he was doing a lot of really bad synthesized music because uh jerry goldsmith uh did um a lot of great music god he really did a lot of uh great music too like uh, chinatown planet uh, of the apes Patton, the burbs seriously 
Uh, he's yeah, he's fantastic. But but there was this period where everybody was experimenting with with, um, you know, synthesizers with, you know, very, you know, comparably limited range. And and you can in, in this movie, you can relate to you can feel it. I just don't think it holds up well. And I probably didn't think much about it in the uh, um, you know, at, at the time. But now just in this recent viewing, it just did not hold up for me. Yeah. Not a, not at all. I'm sorry. I so you know it's okay. Um, you, you know, you you'll can, get through it. You can you can send flowers whenever. <laughs> Who did Glory? Who did the music for Glory? That was James Horner. That was oh, James Horner. That yeah. now that's a score. That's a dude who knows how to write some tunes. He does. He also knows how to recycle his own tunes. <laughs> Oh, like any of the James and the Johns in this in, in this business, James don't know Horner how to does it recycle. more than anyone else. He's got that um, famous famous four note dee dee yeah. that <laughs> that he used. I mean, he I think he first used it in Willow, and I think he's used it in every score since then. It's his Wilhelm scream. What can you say? That's right. I mean, he even in Avatar when the the giant tree or whatever it's called tree of life is falling down and everyone's so sad it's it comes in there again i'm like wow he really does use this all the time <laughs> that's really funny i'm gonna have to listen to it again i actually am not sure that i uh, recognize the diddly d uh, that's exactly what it is da, 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 da. okay i'm gonna go listen to that tonight yeah. i love glory man that's when I, I i wore that one out all right, what do we what else do we have to say about this uh drive what, what movie are we doing tonight? Driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it is important to as far as our, you know, Richard Zanuck series. I mean, he walked away with an Oscar for this one. So, it's uh, yeah. you know, there's definitely a uh a silver lining for him as far as this goes. Yep. Um even though the director of the film was not even nominated, Richard Zanuck did walk away with his Oscar for this film, along with his uh, his lovely wife, Lily Finney. And uh, I, I think this was the only Oscar that he actually won. He's been nominated a number of times, but it's the only one that he won. You know, I don't is are these uh, the Academy Award um, distinctions on Wikipedia? Are these still true that Driving Miss Daisy, Daisy is one? It is the only film based on an off-Broadway production ever to win an Academy Award for Best Picture. Is that still true? You know, I saw all of these as well. And um, let's see, that's uh, that was true as of 2003. Okay. I don't know if it's still true. It is the last Best Picture winner to date to receive a PG rating. I was looking at that. I think that's true. I think that is too. I don't think there have been any others since then all right it is the last film to date and one of only three films ever to win best picture without having received a best director nomination yeah and there's a really interesting um article that i'll send to you i found on film school rejects about that and they called it the impossible oscar the miss daisy phenomenon i'll send it so you can post it in yep. the show notes about that very fact and how rare it was that this actually happened that the, the film won best picture and the director was nominated. And, and that is still true. Okay. And Jessica Tandy at 81 was the oldest winner and oldest nominee ever in the history of the Best Actress category. I believe that's still true. Oldest nominees, oldest winners, best... Uh, oh, there's a whole... God, Wikipedia is fantastic. Oldest winners... I think... What's her name? Um, from yep, Jessica uh, Tandy. Catherine Hepburn was next at, at uh, for On Golden Pond. Yeah, and what's the? Um, it wasn't best actress; it was best supporting actress. Um, uh, what's her name in Titanic? The uh, she didn't win; she was nominated. But what was her name? Oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. Um, Gloria Stewart, eighty-seven years, two hundred twenty-one days. There, there you are. Oh, well done. Phew, she, you know, she was right. born on July fourth, fourth of July. Died yeah. at a hundred years old. Yeah. Something, amazing something patriotic about that <laughs> all right indeed indeed great film great film good talk so next week yes we're uh we're just going a few years forward and we're going to be talking about um another richard zanuck film that his wife actually directed lily finney zanuck uh directed 
the film Rush. This is an interesting one. Do you have any? Uh, have you watched it yet? I've I started it again. I I hadn't seen it since the early nineties, ninety one when it came out. Yep. And so I'm uh, I'm kind of excited to watch it again. I was in I was enjoying what I'd see, what I've seen. I've only made it through about a you know half hour of it again. This movie was tough to track down, and I have really good memory of it. Um, it but I and I'm I'm I it's definitely on my list of movies we like, but uh, I I'm. I'm nervous about whether or not it's going to hold up. All right, all right. So so maybe our conversation next week will be talking about why we should have switched the verdict with Rush. <laughs> with the verdict with Rush, all right. It's because my entire uh, my entire passion about this movie is based on how cool Jason Patrick was in The Lost Boys and my crush on Jennifer Jason Lee. <laughs> And I actually never even really watched the movie. I was just, you know, trying to be Jason Patrick. You were just fascinated yeah, with him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to this movie, and uh, yeah, can't wait to check it out. Where can people find uh, more about you, Doctor? Um, they Dr. can Nelson. find me at Soda Creek Film on Twitter or Facebook, uh, Soda Creek Film, and as always at facebook.com slash movies we like or rashpixel.tv slash mwl. Excellent. I am uh, Pete Wright on the Twitter. Feel free to follow me there. You can always subscribe to the show in iTunes. Make sure you subscribe. If you do, uh, do us a favor. Take a second and uh, and leave us a friendly review of the podcast and, uh, and maybe a you know five star rating if you've if you've got a, a five stars to spare. Uh, it helps other people discover the show and uh, you know sit down and nerd out with us on movies. And oh, w- while we're at it, is we, do we have when is Looper hitting? Uh, Looper, I believe, opens. The last Friday of the month. Okay, so we've got some time. This is our next uh, Google Hangout. Uh, the film board will gather to discuss Looper at the end of the month, and we'll we'll post a date as soon as we have that firmed yep. up. September twenty eighth is when it opens. All right, so we'll be talking that uh, that Saturday. Yeah. Cool deal. Good talk, Andrew. Yes, indeed, sir. And uh, we'll talk soon. You're a doodle, Andy. <laughs> I was going to say that, Trump. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right, 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well... The original trilogy, at least. (laughs) For our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Oh uh, Yeah, I think you have. Plus our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page to screen gems listeners can find the details and links to the original material at the next slash originals every book play or movie you buy through our links helps support the show and it's no extra cost to you so dive in and get your next read today the next slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered but all of the shows on the next real family of podcasts Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals.